You're listening to the Relationship Centered Learning Podcast, a podcast to inspire and empower you to be a difference maker in an aimless educational system. Hear weekly from adults and students who are having a radical impact in the education space as they share from their minds and hearts, giving us practical tools that we can take back to our classrooms and campuses. Here to take you outside the educational box is author, disruptor, and your host, Kevin Curtis. Welcome to the Relationship Center Learning Podcast, where we put relationships at the center of all learning. I am super pumped today. Not only do I get my best friend and my co-founder and my co-host, Denise Circle Mama Holiday on the show, but we have Joe D on the show. Welcome to the show, Joe. What up? Uh, uh, and I should tell you guys, welcome to Seattle. Yes. Welcome to Seattle. So just like every episode, we always want to model connections before content. We do that in what we call the GTKY format. That means connections before content. And we just do that in what we call the flip five. So we're going to give Joe five simple questions and then Joe's going to flip five back to us to get a chance to know each other better. Denise, start out with question number one for Joe, please. All right, Joe, my brother from another mother. What is the one food that you refuse to live without? Uh, goldfish crackers. Goldfish That's, crackers, I'm, okay. But okay, here's the thing that's a misleading question because people think when I say that, that I eat like a child, that I'll order like chicken fingers and fries and that's all I'm gonna eat and that's like the extent of my menu. Not true, I eat like a wildebeest. Uh, I just love goldfish crackers. Ooh, okay. I love it. All right, Joe, if Joe D, is walking into the room. What's that song playing in the background? It's When I Grow Up by the Pussycat Dolls. Okay. There you go. And the lyrics, we're going to quote them. This should be a tattoo on my body somewhere. When I grow up, I want to be famous. I want to be a star. I want to have groupies. Listen, been singing that since I was 12. Thoughts have not gone away, my brother. <laughs> yes, I love it. I love it. All right, what... Um, what is the one uh, Netflix or streaming binge watching are you totally hooked on? Just finished Ratchet. Nurse Ratchet. Oh my. It's insane. like literally <laughs> psychotic, insane, creepy, cuckoo, scary, all of it. But like so captivating. I loved it. The acting was everything. The storyline was like, uh good <laughs> but like everything <laughs> everything else caught me great it was it was fantastic so now i've moved on and it's now my seasonal thing that i watch every fall the great british baking show of course you and i i love to bake boo mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right joe so then i'll i'll segue off denise's question if you were gonna bake something for denise what would you bake her uh, what would I bake Denise? You know what I, I'm gonna, if Denise was coming over, it would be a very special occasion. Like, cause she's traveled, she's here, I gotta treat her right. I would make you a baked brie wrapped in a puff pastry as our appetizer. And then going off, I'm, I'm not talking about bacon sweet. I'm going to bake you some Seattle salmon that I picked up from the Pike Place Market just down the road. And then for dessert, we're not going to bake because we're through with serving all that. We're going to walk down to Proshki Proshki and I'm going to get you the best Russian pastries you've ever had in your life, honey. <laughs> Woo! Okay. All right. Oh, my goodness. See, that's life right there. Joe know how to treat you, Mr. D. So that DMs being three. said, when are you coming to visit Circle Mama? And that's all I like, no, that's not the question. That's not the question. Uh, next question. If you could tell your 13-year-old self something, what would you tell? Uh, everything that everyone says about you doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is what you think about yourself. Mm. That would mm. the mm -hmm. end. The end. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I still have a, I still have a rough time sometimes. You know, when I read through the comments and when I see what people say about because having such a large platform can get a little bit uh, overwhelming at times. And I feel like if that was instilled in me younger, that the only thing that matters is what I think about myself. I think I would have a much easier time with it now. 
in my 30s as an adult. You know, that, yeah. that stuff never leaves. That's why, hello, relation-centered learning and portent. Absolutely. Well yeah. said. So, Joe, I have a final question, and it's a sixth one, but it's selfish, and I'm going to ask you really on my point. If you were in my shoes and you were hosting the Relationship Center Learning Podcast, who would you have on as a guest? Dr. Jose Medina. Okay. Are you familiar with Dr. Jose Medina? No. Dr. Yeah. Jose Medina is the guru for all things dual language learning, but it goes farther, farther past that okay. um, and into accepting other cultures and how we do that as educators and as students. The, a lot of what he does already resins in RCL. Okay. Um, and if our if our target audience is teachers or not, mm -hmm. his message is profound, and I could not recommend him enough. Okay, well there we go. That's five. Jose, Jose Medina, one thousand on Instagram. Tell him Joe sent you. I will. All we right. will definitely reach out. All right, Joe, you got five questions for Denise and I. You can go any way with these. Okay, so this is one question, but I need it from both of you. Where in the world are you guys right now? I am in Austin, Texas. Woo! Babe, you know how we do it. We do it big, big, and bigger here. Yeah. I am right outside San Antonio, Texas and Canyon Lake, Texas. So I'm about 45 minutes north, uh, northwest or northeast of San Antonio. So uh, San Antonio is my home, but I'm about 45 minutes northeast of San Antonio and a little town called Canyon Lake, Texas. That Texas life, though. Every time I meet somebody from Texas, they give me their name and they're like, blah, 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 I'm Texas. I'm like, all right. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so Texas. Um, my next question is for Circle Mama. Circle Mama, I don't know if you remember this, but when we met, I immediately was like, this is my person. Do you still feel that for me? I absolutely do. 100%. Yeah. When Kevin said that you that the time was on last week, that yeah. it was a time that I was training, I was like, no, we gotta figure this out. I, I, I love it. And let me tell you why I absolutely love you so much. Um, watching so many of your videos, uh, my favorite was the caca, how you get kids there. It's that part of stepping outside of what we say traditional teaching is and really making it relevant um, and important and fun for kids. And you do it proudly and with no hesitation. And I love everything about what you do and who you are. Uh, God, I just love you. Remind me, remind me after we're not recording anymore to tell you, you said one thing to me that when you said it, I was like this one. Yes, this is my bestie. I'll remind you later. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Kevin, what is the best thing to happen to you this week? This week, um, it's a good question. This week, I think the best thing that happened to me was um, I got to eat one of my favorite meals. Uh, there's a Italian restaurant, literally like two miles down the road, Joe. Mm -hmm. um, they do a stuffed shrimp uh, with angel hair pasta. It's all, uh -huh. it's all handmade. Their garlic knots are incredible. A bottle of wine, and they have a chocolate mousse cake that is to die for. And so when I order it, I'm sorry, I can't order just one piece of cake. I ordered two. So it's just one of those, it's one of those indulgence meals where you're just like, it just, it makes, it turns everything around when you eat that meal. So Ooh. to me, as soon as you said that, I was like, that's probably the highlight of my week so far. I love it. I love that. F food is where the heart is. Let me tell you what. I don't have a. I don't. I have a stomach where my heart belongs. It's crazy. Love it. Um, Denise, when did you dye your hair? Um, probably about um two or three months ago. Hey, now. Go this is not the original color like it was blonde blonde it was platinum blonde it was platinum blonde and i was loving it and so when she did it again she kind of toned it down and so i was like look boo, we're gonna have to go on and get that platinum back popping because i was slaying the platinum <laughs> oh my god I <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't dye my hair, but I did grow a mullet. I, I, we so see the back. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Love Austin, it. keep it weird, right? That's Absolutely. Right. Always. Um, and then, Kevin, on the same platform, I just got to very bluntly ask you this, too. No. I'm currently going through this in my own life. Okay. Um, and I need your pro tips. <laughs> when did you start going bald, and how did you resin with that? Because I'm currently um, at a crisis in my life with my hair falling out, and I want to you know, either just shave my head, right? give all my money to the best surgeon and just change my scalp completely. So what, what's the pro tip? Uh, uh, so unfortunately I started losing it in my late twenties. Mm -hmm. And so it was exactly 20 years ago. Um, it was the school year of 99, 2000. Um, I was a baseball coach. Um, we were really poorly playing at the beginning of the season joe and i was like look man like i was i drove we just got beat 21 to nothing in a baseball game i'm like they kicked the extra points and everything this is a baseball game right 21 to nothing i'm driving back on the bus and my team was like hey coach we're gonna be okay and i was like yeah you know you try to be encouraging the kids but you they can see it on my face i'm whipped i, I had moved six and a half hours away from home to take this job i didn't know anybody i didn't know the community i was just it was just struggling and so long story short they had said well what if we make the playoffs and i was like make the playoffs <laughs> what if we win a game, right? We hadn't won a game yet. And they said, hey, if we make the playoffs, will you take us out to eat? I was like, sure. And they were like, will you buy us shirts? And they were like, yeah, sure. And they were like, can we shave your head? Sure. Last game of the season, Joe, we win in the bottom of the ninth inning. And next thing you know, they're like, you're taking us to eat. We're, for, we're, we're getting shirts. We're shaving your head. I was like, what? <laughs> I, I don't remember that in my depressed state. And I, I was in my late I was in my late 20s and I had an assistant coach that was in his 50s and he looked at me and said, ah, coach, I don't care. I'll shave, right? But I had a younger coach who had just graduated from college. So he was probably maybe 23 or so. He looked at me and said, do I have to shave my head? I was like, if I'm shaving my head, we're all shaving it. So we did junior, seniors. We let it all, we did it all. <clears throat> but I would tell you, Joe, and I'm being really honest, it, even though I was balding, I was, I was balding. I was losing it. There was a huge transformation, I will tell you, from balding to bald. Like when they shaved it and they, and they covered my ear or my eyes and they walked me to the mirror and they videotaped it, I looked in the mirror and I was like, oh, so that's what bald looks like. Because it, it, I don't know what it is. Seriously, true, honest. There's something about having some hair versus no hair. There, it's like night and day. And so I will tell you, even after I shaved it for the next three months, I wore a hat. Um, and of course, I looked like, you know, I had white, pale white you know, a, you know, a scalp. So it looked like it was either you know coming from chemo or struggling with something. And, and so I, I literally was so uncomfortable, Joe, for it took me three months to get the self courage to just say, screw it. I'm just going to be bald. And, and yeah. it, but it took me about three months to be comfortable enough with myself and looking at other people. I started looking at other people. I'd be like, Hey, he's bald. Oh, Hey, he's bald. Okay. He looks pretty good. You know? Oh my God. I, that's me right now. Okay. So that's what I'm trying. So then I, what I would do, Joe, is I would be like, okay, I'd look at his head and, and I'd say, well, yes, facial hair. And I had a goatee at the time, not a beard, but I was like, okay, the facial hair. I started analyzing the crap out of myself. Me me okay. Too. So just know, I apologize for the long winded answer, no, it's okay. but that was really my, my, and so from then I've had it ever since every three days, I just shave it in the shower and I'm done. See, this all came about for me too. I remember uh, I was 22. It was like my first or second year teaching and it was the MLK parade and we were walking down the hallway and this, I was going down the stairs with my class and the kindergartners were coming up the stairs and this kindergarten looked at me and goes, hey, Mr. D, you're going bald kind of. And that was the first time I had heard it. Leave it to a kindergartner to tell you the truth, right? Oh. The only person in my life who told me was this kindergartner. And I, I went in the mirror and I was like, I swear to God, I got it. <laughs> and it's just been going ever since. But rah, rah, rah. yep, <laughs> you gotta go. It his life. All right. So, hey, great questions. Connections before content. 
It's the best thing. We got to model it before we get into today's content about the show. That's a great opportunity for those listeners. If you're looking for questions like the ones that Joe and Denise and I came up with, we've got a great resource out there for you. All you have to do is head over to rclfirst.com. Click on the link. You can get free 28 GTKY questions. So you can download instantly take back in your classroom virtually, or even do this with your teachers for your staff to make connections before content. So great job guys of uh, using the GTKY format. So, so let's get right into it, Joe. I think Denise and I, as we met you at the conference, you had no idea that we were like your stalker fans from behind the scenes. I like, I know, I know. <laughs> and that's okay. You have many. But one thing I, I've always wanted to get a chance to ask you, because I know we sat down and we had lunch that day and we really got a chance to have some further conversations. But I mean, like, like Joe, what really got you into being a teacher? Like, what really put you into that space? Of like, okay, now I want to be an educator. Was it an accident? Was it intentional? Yeah, you know, I think it was a little bit of an accident. So I, okay, the way to make it in comedy is two things. Either you go all in and you're a straight up starving artist for as many years as it takes you to not be anymore. Or you have a day job, right? So I actually was a stand-up comedian for my third grade talent show. Like it was always something that I wanted to do. And when it came to college time, I told my parents, I was, I was definitely going to college. I, I knew I wanted to go to college. They wanted me to go to college. And I was saying, I'm going to just major in something like theater or something a little bit, you know, m that I can focus on my comedy with. And they were like, eh, no, you're not. And I was like, oh, wow. Okay. Well, I guess I'm not. And then I was like, yeah, I guess I can work with kids. Let's figure it out. So I... Your, your freshman year, you don't really have any, you just start basically taking gen eds, none of which had to do with teaching. But I was a, um, in a fraternity. And my fraternity's national philanthropy is called uh, the Serious Fun Network. And basically it's a series of summer camps all over the world that serve terminally and severely um, ill children. And I had the opportunity to volunteer one summer for a couple of weeks. And I went and I was like into it, but I was kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm just, I'm good at this, but like, whatever, you know? And then the time came to take the kids to the high ropes course. And we had one kid who was, I get so emotional whenever I tell the story. I had one kid who was in a, he was like fully wheel chair bound completely had been almost his entire life and we're like wheeling him over to the high ropes course i'm like oh this is gonna suck you know they actually adapted the entire high ropes course to be able to accommodate all students regardless of what your disability or or illness was so it was adaptable and he was able to do the whole thing in his wheelchair and like he didn't want to do it at first i talked him off a ledge he went up and did it and like watching him go through the high ropes course with this just no fear, uninhibited joy, pure joy, mm -hmm. and without any care in the world or struggle to watch a kid who has been through so much go through that. I literally, before he even got down, I was like, I, I have to have to do this like this is what i think i'm gonna do and i can still con like reach my goals and go towards my other dreams while i do this but i have a lot of years to come and i think this is how i want to spend it so i did mm. and i went into teaching yeah man that is amazing you know when i think about that moment um that got you headed saying, saying, you know what, this is it. This is where I want to go. Um, I think about so many educators out there who either it was by chance, um, some it was chosen, but how important it is to know your why mm -hmm. or finding your why. Um, man, like I said, you are exactly what I needed um, when I was a Yes. And it hits you at all different times, right? Like I wasn't expecting, you know, I, I, I don't really like this answer when I'm on an interview panel to hire a new teacher. You know how so many new teachers are like, I, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. I used to play teacher with my siblings growing up, but I'm always like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But like, you know, but like, I wasn't like that. So I kind of always look for candidates who were like 
caught off guard by some sort of outer body kismet experience that may or may not should or shouldn't have happened, but like changed their direction so profoundly that they were like, I want to do this for for peasant scraps, mind you. Right. And still do it. Like that's the type of stuff where I'm like, you're, you have a teacher heart. You're supposed to do this. Well, it's so funny, Joe, because you said, I love how you said it's starving artists, right? So I want to be a stand-up comedian who doesn't make Jack, <laughs> right? Or a teacher. Yeah. Or you're like, but I'm going to supplement that starving artist with a teacher's salary, right? So, Well, well, I did. I, I will tell you this. I knew what I was getting into going into teaching, obviously. Um, but the consistency is what did it for me, too. Okay. Like I, you know, if you're if you're just pursuing comedy, you're not guaranteed that next paycheck and if you are it's not necessarily going to look like what it was last month but i knew teaching i would have uh benefits insurance built in i'd be getting very little pay but it would be consistent coming in and i could learn how to live off that while i'm tackling my other goals right so here we go joe then then that's interesting because i i I never knew how you got into it and you got into it but now joe you're into it and, and as much as we're kind of playing around the idea of like, yeah, it was, you know, it gave me stable income, whatever. But, but Joe, the reason that we found you is because you were making a difference. Like you, you weren't just collect. And the reason I say that is I want to make very clear. I have had kids who have come to me and said, Mr. Curtis, you know, that teacher is only here to collect a paycheck. And the reason I say that is those, they have the, what they call the BR meter, the be real meter. Right. In other words, it's not a BS. It's a be real, you know, uh, to give you a quick, an- a quick antidote and story. Like we hired a seventh grade social studies teacher one time at, at the middle school where we piloted restorative practices. And in about three weeks in Joe, he was struggling. You could just tell he was struggling all over the place. The kids were struggling. He was struggling. My principal's like, Hey, why don't you just take a deep dive with him and you know sit down with him? And so the first thing I said was this, Hey, how are things going? He's like, this is horrible. You know, I'm like, okay. And I'm like, well, ask them a simple question in the first five minutes. What do my kids know about you? And he was like, no, Nothing. I don't want my kids to know. These are the worst kids ever, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I was like, ding, ding, ding. I could know why he was struggling, particularly on my Title I campus. It was 80% minority, right? And he was this white guy. And so um, I, I, I came back and I was like, well, let me see what I can do. My principal's like, Kevin, go in there and like build a bridge. Like these, I've looped up with these kids. This is their, I, I was daddy disciplined for this pilot group. So Ooh, I, I love that daddy discipline. <laughs> oh, I love that. So I was daddy disciplined. So I had spent two years with these kids. This was my third year. He said, Kevin, nobody knows these kids better. You go in there and you get this teacher to get to, you know, build a relationship with these mm-hmm. kids. Right. Mm-hmm. I looked at him. I was like, there's not enough wood out there to, but i was like yes sir you tell me what to do so i went in there and we created a powerpoint joe like you know your dog and this and that and and i was like you just we always talk about it in a lot of our podcasts i think almost every educator has said you got to be vulnerable ordinary you know human whatever the words are right you got to show them that but he had this wall up because he was really intimidated by these kids so i'm in there and i'm we're doing the dog and pony show and he would be like i have a dog and i'm like you know i'm trying to you got to do you got to connect with the kids well third period LaJoy walks in LaJoy, and LaJoy, as soon as i walk as soon as she walks in joe i know something's up because as soon as she walks in she's like mr curtis why are you in here like right out the bat, like it was odd, right? And I was like, LaJoy, I want to come see my my family, my kids. I want to spend some time with her. And she was like, mm-hmm, mm. she ain't buying it, right? And I felt like I was on an episode of Undercover Boss, you know, and you just felt like you're waiting to get busted. So we're going through the dog and pony show and blah, blah, blah. In the middle, like you said, just like your kindergartner, my eighth grader had no filter. And she stood up and she said, I know why you're in here. And I looked at her and she said, because of him. And she pointed at the teacher, Joe. And I was just like, like the mustache, the, the bad toupee, the fake tattoo rolled up, whatever it was, right? Like busted, right? And I was like, LaJoy, no. And she said, Mr. Curtis, you ain't got nothing to worry about. We've already, this is what she said. We've already talked. He won't last another month here. He quit the next week, Joe. And I'm telling you, I said, when we went to hire, I said, um, raise my hand at the meeting. I said, can we have LaJoy on the hiring committee, please? No, I, honestly, God, I, I, <laughs> quick, quick pause, quick yeah, pause. Yeah. For anybody listening, putting kids on the hiring panel is maybe, maybe second round. Right. You know, 
is will sh- change the ch- culture of your building. Yeah. Bada bang. It gives them so much ownership to walk around the building and say, I hired him. <laughs> like, like, try it. At least try it. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Keep going. No, 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 no. I think it's great. Joe. But here's the deal. Here's where I was going full circle with this. Mm-hmm. They knew that teacher was there, not for them. The reason you got on the Ellen show, the reason that we people started to celebrate it and Mr. D became times three, right? This big is because you obviously realized, Joe, you weren't doing it for a paycheck. And just, right. you know, so talk to us a little bit about like how you became synonymous with just helping kids be successful in a classroom. You treating them like a family, the things that you, the, the people that may not know you, T- preach and teach a little bit about what you were and who you became as a teacher, despite how you came into it. Mm-hmm. Um, this is, this might be a little bit long winded, but I'm going to, that's okay. Right so um, I always connected to using my comedy uh, in my classroom with my kids. Now what a lot of people do, if a lot of people see my clips on Ellen, you know, I'm very much exclusively talking about the teacher side of my life, which is true, but I didn't really have an opportunity to talk about the comedy side of my life. And the fact of the matter is, you know, teachers make so little that the vast majority of educators have second or third jobs to cap off their bills at the end of the month. And for me, I remember very distinctly, there were times in my, in my first five years where I would quite literally have to choose Uh, buying groceries or putting gas in my car and there was one time where I was like I think I have to walk to work for the next two weeks in in, in the middle of Michigan winter right teachers shouldn't have to do that mind you but um so I was a stand-up comic and I would go to work and I was actually a stand-up comic and a spin cycle instructor so I would go to work I would teach cycle go home take a shower and then hit the clubs and do my sets for another like $40 or whatever it was. Uh, And it was really, really rough, but really fun because it made me a stronger educator. Like, like being a teacher is being, it's, it's a stage. You are the main character. You have to, um, you have to keep these little people's attention at all costs and make these split decisions to it's it is it is acting it is a stage and for me with that comic sense I very quickly on in my education career realized that the rules of the club applied to the classroom as well I had when I was on stage every once in a while I'd get a heckler who would yell at me and say some stuff and boo me off stage and who oh, that was happening all the time in the classroom too except the kids were worse you know so it's like it was making me it was preparing me for that and then being able to read the room you go you got to read the comedy club you know you have a you have a you go you go in and you have a set of jokes right and you deliver those jokes but if you're just going to go in and deliver those jokes in the way that you planned you're going to lose because very quickly on within your first two jokes you're going to realize oh this audience likes jokes that are more like this oh they really they like when i get more animated and less just standing here so you adapt what you're going to do for the rest of your set and you cater to them well it's the same thing in the classroom how it never if you're going to look at me right now and tell me that you go into the classroom to teach and it goes the exact way you have planned and ever you're a liar and you can go clip down to red. Just kidding. We don't need that <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but it was making me extremely better. And then to realize the power of humor with kids is exactly what you just said. You know, just like we do the five questions at the beginning of the day, using humor, let them know who I am. They showed them I'm a person. It showed them I'm not just a teacher. I have, I have uh, desires and I have, I have motivation and I have... Um, a sense of humor and a way as a very particular sense of humor. And I'm going to invite that and show you how, how that's done. So, so when I started using comedy in the classroom and talking about that a little bit more, uh, that really resonated with a lot of teachers to say, Hey, I can, I, w- I would like to try a little bit of this. I would like to do this more often. I think my kids would benefit from using humor in the classroom. So then it went from there, but I would, a little bit we're like midway into the podcast episode i do want to be forthcoming too i had a lot of struggles in education as well um and particularly uh being a teacher who's on the lgbtq spectrum is very 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 difficult and um i spent the vast majority of my career still not being myself Mm -hmm. and i felt that that was 
not wrong to just me, but wrong to people in general. And I very quickly realized that teachers are often told to fit this very specific mold of who they must act like and who they must be and what they must do when they leave the classroom and not do. And I don't think that's right because two things. One, if students are getting the same cookie cutter design of an educator year after year after year, they're not going to learn how to work with different kinds of people. And on the other hand, if they come in my classroom and they meet this unique individual who is, you know, a uh, uh, confident gay man who loves them and is treating them with respect well when they leave the education system and go off to college or the workforce and they meet a person who's on the lgbt scale i would hope that they'll reflect on their time in fourth grade and say actually my fourth grade teacher was a great guy and he was gay so you might be too or 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 they might say my fourth grade teacher was gay and he was kind of a dick and you might be too, but he cared about me. He yeah. cared about me. So I know he was a good person because you don't have to get along with everybody. You don't have to get along with it. So that struggle was very, very real. So um, two years ago, I actually ended up leaving the classroom to pursue uh, comedy full time under with with education in mind and i believe that the things that i'm doing and the, the platform that i've been given now i can reach more educators and i started to realize that that was almost even more my calling than working with kids because now if i can talk and say these words without a target on my back from a school district principal or superintendent then i hope that i can affect more teachers to be themselves and ultimately that's going to reach more students so when i go to a speaking gig and i'm talking to three thousand teachers who are each going back to classrooms of 30 kids minimum that's a huge difference that i'm making so a couple of the things that i've done since then um besides just you know, being an advocate for teachers and using comedy to speak the truth about education. If you come to one of my shows, you'll, you'll laugh your ass off. I'm so sorry. I shouldn't be saying these words. You're going to laugh, 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 laugh. But later you're going to leave and you're going to get in your car and you'll be like, that was kind of dark and it's serious because that's how teaching really is. So I'm, I'm saying how it really is. But the other thing that I've done is I've actually started um, a scholarship in my name. It's called the Mr. Dombrowski First Year Teacher Scholarship. And it is a scholarship that provides funds to Title I educators who are in their first or second year of teaching. And essentially what I do is um, I award the candidate a very large, large sum of money. And I tell them, this is for you. This is for you to do what you have to do to feel comfortable in your life. Because if you feel more comfortable in your personal life, you're going to be a better teacher. So spend this money and pay off your car. Go buy yourself a cute outfit for parent-teacher conferences that you can also wear when you go out with your friends. Uh, you know, maybe get your car washed. Get your floors redone at your house. Pay for your pets. Whatever it is that's going to make you as a person feel more stable and comfortable financially, that's going to make you a better teacher. So being able to help these teachers who are passionately working in Title I, like I did my entire career and knowing how hard that was, well, now I have this huge platform. I'm always going to use it for the teachers, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, seeing that what I did in the classroom of how, and how it affected so many educators really made me realize that uh, the calling was to the teacher and I needed to do that. I needed to, you know, end my relationship with working with students so closely. But I do believe that what I'm doing now um, is very sneakily making uh, an impact. I do believe that. Absolutely. I love, love, love it. And that's truly who you are. And that's why I love you, Joe. Like really, and I can say that I love you and I truly, truly mean it. You're a phenomenal educator. And I think about the thing that's most impactful for me uh, when I saw the video of um, you and your students on the playground and you were calling them in, it wasn't so much, it, one, it was very creative how you did it, but what really stood out for me is the looks on their faces mm -hmm. as they lined up. Like it was the kids, it was in their body language, it was in their faces. They were excited to come to that calling, not just to the calling, but to know like, this is my teacher. How can other educators, what can they do to make an impact 
on their students in that way. I think, oh my gosh, my teachers called me uh, to line up and it was like, we were cursing her out. Like, what you know, we were throwing, foolishness was going on. But the looks in their faces, how happy they were to come and line up with you, not for you. What can you say? I gotta be honest too, the, the, the biggest thing that I, th- always say to educators when I'm on stage is like, don't try and be me. Like if you see something that was working for you that I'm doing, adapt it to be you because the kids will have that same joy in their eye and they will have that same experience from you being yourself. And what you see in that video when I call my students over to me is me being my organic, authentic self that I am in the classroom at all hours of every single day. So they were, you know, they did like, this is my teacher, you know what I mean? But, but that might not be you, that might not be the listener and that's okay. But if you are yourself, they're gonna connect to the authenticity more than you are because students can smell fake a mile away and they're not gonna connect to it. So my biggest thing for teachers is let them into your life, like show them your colors. Who are you? Like what makes you unique and special? Is it about your interests and passions or is it about your culture and your family? Just draw them in by just being yourself. And here's the other thing that not a lot of people say, which is why I'm kind of happy that I'm not in the classroom anymore. I can say stuff like this. You don't have to like every kid. You know, we don't, we don't go through our days as adults liking and getting along with every other adult that we meet. You don't have to like every kid, but you have to be good enough of an actor to make them feel special and make them think that you love them more than anything. Because at the end of the day, you're going to take care of those babies. You're going to take care of those babies. But it is okay to look at yourself and say, this one's not for me. Like it's, that's an okay human emotion, right? But when you're more honest with yourself about these feelings that you have in the classroom and for your kids and for your practice, you can be okay with what you're doing, which allows you to then fully be yourself. Mm. So that's kind of, that's like the, that's the advice that I give. No, I think it's great advice. Um, It's interesting, Joe, because being the host of this show, it's, it's, there's a lot of great nuggets that I take away from all the listeners. So as I'm recording them, I'm like, oh my God, this is added to my repertoire, right? <clears throat> and on episode one, we had a guy named Joe Beckman and he's in the Minnesota area. He had talked about sometimes our teachers are trying to be too extraordinary. They forget to just be ordinary. And he said, just like you did, he rattled off a formula. He said, I believe they could do it under the Ford method, F-O-R-D, not the truck or the vehicle. They can talk about, if they don't know how to be ordinary, they can talk about their family, occupation, recreation, or dreams. And the reason, I, the reason I'm illustrating this, Joe, is, is because I, if listeners, after listening to you know half a dozen podcasts so far, the same message keeps coming from every one of our guests, Joe, which is the same thing, like be yourself. And you have no idea. You've said two things, and I know you've never been to our staff developments, but what's interesting, I always say this be you. Like you can't be me. Don't be Joe. Don't be, be you. You have to build relationships by being you. You have to be genuine. You have to be authentic. The kids will see right through it. So everything you're saying, I say, but a lot of teachers always say, but I don't know how. Wow. That's, that is something, isn't it? And, mm. But I'm, and you, and that's because it becomes natural for you, me and Denise, right? We look at them like perplexed, like you don't know how, And they're genuinely like, nobody taught me in college or teacher preparation, right? How to be genuine, authentic, vulnerable, ordinary, whatever the word you want to use, Mr. Curtis, at the end of the day, nobody taught me that. And it wasn't in my textbook. And I'm not accountable for that. Is that going to be in my evaluation, being vulnerable, being ordinary? So... As much as you've appreciated this, Joe, Mm -hmm. leaving public education, I left because it was the flipping box. And I was tired of being in the box and being told what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and then watch it all be, not all, I shouldn't use general, but watch a lot of it be unsuccessful, right? So I said, just like you, Joe, 
I met Denise coming out of the box and saying, that's it. I got to make a difference. I got to do something different. And just like you realize this platform gives me a lot more ability to resonate with a lot more people in education than being in my one school or one, my one classroom or one, my one building or one district. And what I've appreciated about this platform is I can sit there and say with certainty now, what's the problem? Like, why, why can't you connect with kids? And, and what I started, and, and I'm going to be really honest, Joe, what I started saying is until this is unfortunately our realistic, realistic approach, 80% of our educators are like this. Just tell us what to do. 10% will, will excel. Those are just the, the, ex, the cream rises to the top. 10% at the bottom aren't going to do anything, no matter what you tell them to do anyways. They're there just to collect the paycheck. 80% are good soldiers and they just say, tell us what to do. But the problem with my hypothesis, Joe, is, is that education doesn't hold them accountable and doesn't necessarily tell them how to build relationships, when to build relationships, hold them accountable for relationships. So what happens is, is they wing it. And I came up with this phrase, you can't wing relationships. And so what happens is there's no intentionality, there's no accountability, nobody's, there's no relationship report, there's no accountability for connections. And so we put it on a shirt. We put them at the bottom of our email and don't forget to connect with kids or connect before content or we love to say all these things. But when it comes to real application of putting it in action, we fail in education. Absolutely. Sorry, that's my soapbox. No, and I totally believe it too, which is why I've always, oh God, I get so much heat for saying this though. I believe there is not enough time in the school day. There is not, or the school year, which right. is why I'm like, I'm actually a little bit more pro- year-round school i don't know if you guys have that down there in texas but if you think about it like year-round school what if i was actually allowed to take all of monday to just do relationships team building exercise leadership all those life skills that our students we cannot guarantee that they're getting taught this at home we cannot that right. we're doing them a disservice by not. But if every Monday we were able to take the whole day and focus on the student as a person, rather than a data point, rather than a plot, mm -hmm. rather than a score and a number, like how much more effective would we be in our, in our career? It's just, it's, it's, it's so sad how what you're saying is like so data-drivenly true yet so unknown, underestimated. P people don't take it for real or for granted. And then, oh, I bet you hear this too all the time too. How often do you guys hear, oh, I don't have time. I have, I have, a, I have scores, I have data I have to get in. I have to get, um, I, have to, I, have to, I have an evaluation. I have to write four pages of my evaluation before it's even due. I don't have time to get to know them. We're not talking about computer chips here, people. We're talking about people. <laughs> oh, Joe, it's our, it's our number one, uh, number one obstacle. I know, you know, I know. No, no, you know what I tell them, Joe, in the middle of that, when I hear that stuff, I'm like, well, what about our time? I said, oh, oh, wait, y'all didn't hear last night at your school board meeting? They just made a decision last night at the school board meeting. You guys are getting an hour lunch starting tomorrow. They're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's going to cost you 30 minutes of instruction time, but you guys get an hour lunch. They're like, yay, we get an hour lunch. I'm like, wait a minute. Did you just hear you lost 30 minutes of instruction? And it's, that's why right. time is perception. But if I gain an hour lunch, I'm not worried about that 30 minutes of instruction time now. I tell them time is all relevant. And that's why I'm really super proud, Joe, that we have recognized to kind of navigate and maneuver around the time thing mm -hmm. is we have come up with three tools, 60 second relay break, two minute connection, and 90 second spark plan. Three tools that take less than two minutes to build and sustain relationships that you could do on a daily basis so that the schools that haven't gone to the all Monday where we can just connect with kids, you know, and work up. So we just said, hey, so if we give you a tool that you can do in two minutes, now what's your excuse? And they Power. still have excuses. Are they oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, they have, okay, the students are going to not take it serious or there's going to be this problem. And so then what do we do? We walk into the classroom and we model it for them, um, especially me. I'll walk in and I'm going to model with your class. The kids have never met me ever. And I walk into your class and do a two minute connection. And the kids are like, when are you coming back? Circle mama. I'm a stranger. We want circle mama to come back. 
I'm a stranger. Yeah. So if yeah. I can walk into your class. And that's the deal though. It's me being able to walk into your class, a total stranger and ask a question that is low risk, fun, engaging, the kids love it, bam, in and out, and you can be back to your academics. So what is the problem there? Right. Okay. Denise, you know what that just reminded me of too? People used to always say to me, they're like, how do you, okay. I, oh, I always taught in like smaller schools. So we're talking two or three of every grade level K five, right? One year, one year only I sold my soul to the devil and taught in this bougie, bougie, bougie school and hated every single day of it. And I will openly tell them that. And I literally told my boss, I was like, I, it was like mid year. And I was like, here's a thing. Can't do this. You know, <laughs> like when parents, when parent, I had a parent, I was doing a lot of relationship building and a parent came up to me and said, I don't think my daughter's learning needs are being met. I was like, do you even know your daughter's learning needs? Anyway, anyway. So I'm in these smaller settings and people would always say to me, how do you know all these kids' names in other grades? And I would literally, they'd go by the hallway and I'd be like, Dennis, Richard, Dion, all of them. And I just like, boom, boom, boom. Like if you walk through past my door, Throughout the school day, at any time, I'm probably going to know you. If you're on a different floor, probably not. But I'm probably going to know you. Do you know how much of a difference that makes if you're a fourth grade teacher, but you said hi to the third graders consistently the year before? Like, I'm... I. Humble brag. I was, <laughs> I was that teacher who the kids would come in and be like, oh my God, I got Mr. D, I got Mr. D. And I would always feel bad because I'm like, shh, shh, shh. like I don't want to make the other ones feel bad. <laughs> but most of the time it was only because I knew their name. I knew their name coming in. Like I said, hi to you every day. We talked every day. And those simple tasks that Kevin take 30 seconds, one minute. Now you can knock 10 kids names out as they walk past your door in the morning and it'll take you less than a minute. That is power, baby. Yeah, it's power. And, and not only that, imagine the, the life, the impact that you make on that one kid who actually really needed to be noticed that's not in your classroom. <clears throat> um, and, I, you know, I was telling Kevin, I think about Mr. Starling. I was a little shit. And I would curse him out. I was mean. I was angry. I was hurt. But you know what? No matter what. Every day he would still say, good morning. It's so good to see you. I'm glad you're here. And I used to think, what is wrong with him? Like, I just cursed him out yesterday. One. Two, he didn't write me a discipline referral, which I was very used to that. And three, he keeps coming back. But you know what that did for me? That turned on a light bulb in uh, my head, my heart, that maybe there is something good in there that I just don't see. And guess what? He pulled it and he pulled it out. I don't know if that was his intention, but he made the biggest difference in my life. If it wasn't for him, Joe, I would be dead or in prison. No lie. Right, right. And you know what? I, I'm so sorry I have to say, I'm not shocked. I'm not shocked and surprised because that's all it takes. It takes one caring adult. The end. The end, period. Yeah. Oh, my. oh, and that's going to bring me back to the very first question you asked me, who would be somebody else that I would have on the podcast? Mm -hmm. If you're not familiar with Dr. Jody Carrington, she's a child psychologist from Alberta, Canada, and she has a book out called Kids These Days, and it's all about the importance of connection. And she says all a kid needs is one caring adult to make a difference. So we need to make sure that all the kids that walk into our building get one caring adult at the minimum. She's fantastic. Look her up. She would do this in a second. Absolutely. Yeah. I bought her book. Actually, I followed her on social media and yeah. bought her book just because of what you just said. I, I'm always looking for people. What's interesting is their messages resonate with something that we've we've worked with or or, or that we kind of preach and teach. And so when when I look at you, Joe, I I always love the fact that you're I'm on gorgeous. Yeah, well, that too, of course. Oh, it. Okay. It was just, I, sorry. I <laughs> no, I, I, I sneak it. We sneak, it uh, sneak it in, Joe. Sneak it in. Uh, no, I. I've always appreciated your authenticity and your realness. And so, even though you may have had to hide behind it for certain circumstances, the fact that you have become the person that you want to become, 
and you're doing the thing that you want to do, super proud of you. I'm, I'm just proud of the platform and the way that you are using your voice. So when you use comedy, right? What would, what would be some of the messages, you know, not necessarily the jokes, I don't want you to have to spill, you know, but teasers, but what would be some of the messages that you do share during your comedy show that you think teachers would really resonate with be like, this is why it would be important to listen to somebody like Joe when it comes to the comedic side of being a teacher. Uh, one of the biggest reoccurring themes that happens in my show is that teachers get their summers off to survive and it comes off multiple times. And the way I uh, present that is by telling the top stories of me in the classroom that people would never for a second believe is true. And I start the show by saying, You're, you guys aren't going to believe this. Everything I'm about to tell you is 100% true. 100% true. And then I tell the story and I can hear them in the audience like, no way. No, I'm like, oh yeah, non-teacher. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I constantly am bringing that phrase up, like teachers have their summers off to survive because I cannot handle people undermining the educator, the modern American educator. You do not know what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. Therefore, you will not speak about how that is going to go down, right? So one of the biggest examples I give is I had a parent come in for parent teacher conferences and her student, we had talked so many times. So she was not blindsided, but this is when I taught in the bougie school. She said to me, see, I don't think you understand. You know, I pay my taxes. So technically you work for me. And I have a very quick tongue if you haven't caught on. And I said, Oh, that's so funny. Cause I pay my taxes. too, So technically I'm self-employed actually. But, you know, like this is my classroom. This is, you know, I'm going to do it too. I'm basically paying part of my own salary. So don't try me. And when I say that line, you can hear the audience be like, oh my God. And be like, honey, that is mild compared to what other teachers have heard from parents who undermine and disrespect. So don't let me hear out of your mouth that I am just a teacher and I should be paid less because I get my summers up. Literally, we get our summers off for our mental health because, and then a little bit of a spoiler alert. This is kind of cool. Um, my book got picked up by publication. So it's going to be coming out hopefully at the end of 2021. So keep an eye out for that. But in the book, you know, I go even darker into some of the things that happen in, in the classroom and I tell, tell the reader that there are things that you could never, ever, ever be prepared for through your undergraduate studies when you get in the classroom. And a small spoiler alert, but um, one of my students had a very, very, very rough family life. Um, was his, his mom was addicted to drugs and out of his life completely. And then his biological father uh, overdosed on drugs. And I, the teacher, was the, was the number one consistent adult figure in his life. So I was called into the foster care facility to tell him I was the teacher. This, these are things that they, you just have to be a teacher. You just have to have a teacher heart. You have to innately have it within your blood to be able to hold on to that with you for the rest of your life, that you had to do something like that. And the everyday American thinks that they know what we do. They think they know what it's like because they went to school or they have a kid who's in school. So they think they know. They don't know. So my main mission really in the show is to use comedy to bring out these darker undertones. So you're laughing with me in the moment, but you get in your car and you're like, ooh, mm. we, gotta, we have to do something about this. Mm. And that's why I do what I do. Mm. Love that. Love how you go about doing that. Sounds a lot kind of like circle, you know? Absolutely. It is. It is. Yeah, it is. Love it. Driving away, thinking about like, does that really happen? Is that what an educator really has to deal with? And I think most who are not educators have no idea some of the things. Um, I know Kevin's experience is my own with students and literally having to save a life, sit in a car while a young lady is trying to commit suicide. Yep. Uh, I'll never forget that. And she made it, but there's a, we have a lot 
on our plate and I would do it all over again um, for the students. 100%. They, so Joe, people, go ahead. People uh, often uh, think about this too and they look at us and uh, we're Title I educators and they're like, oh, it's because they teach in these Title I schools. It is not. This is everywhere. It's just masked differently depending on where you're at in the world. But this is everywhere. So this is every teacher, regardless if you're teaching in a very affluent area and you're, you have parent support or you don't. These things happen to the modern American teacher regardless of where you're at. So, Joe, how do you feel the pandemic has impacted teachers what are you seeing what are you observing what are you supporting what 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 are your experiences about teachers going back to school in the mid pandemic uh again i'm seeing teachers completely being undermined i'm seeing teachers going from heroes in january to the complete villain uh in august and it is crazy to me that people are going against the teacher when teachers are advocating for their own life and safety for the life that they live as well. You know, there are, and where am I, where am I at on the scale? Now, personally, I believe that uh, we need to start looking at the pandemic and education on a need be basis and an individual basis, because I don't think it's necessary to tell the entire country every school is going um, full digital because, you know, I was, I went on a trip to Yellowstone this summer, and as I was driving down the street, we drove past some very, very, very small, I'm not even kidding, like almost one-room schoolhouse-esque schools, and I thought to myself, I was like, well, these schools in these areas might not need to go full, uh, full digital. One, because they might not have the same capabilities. So their learning, if their learning was only virtual, might be impaired so much that they're not going to learn anything for a year and a half. But also their community is so small that if we're actually monitoring the levels of coronavirus and things like that, they might, it might be safe for them to go back in the classroom. Hold on. I'm so sorry. My alarm is going off. No. Um, but then the other thing too, you know, we look at like these big inner city schools. Like I'm here in Seattle and there are schools that are going back and I'm looking at them. I'm like, it is not ready here. It's not ready here. But you're making these teachers go back. And I'm, I hear from at least one teacher every day who comes with me and asks me for advice on if they should stay or quit their job because they have a sick family member at home who cannot be exposed to this. Or they have these other things and their school is telling them, tough, what, it, what do you choose? And that's not right. That's not right. Yeah. No, I totally agree. I... It, I'm with you, Joe. There's there, there's not one method of madness to be able to go back during this. I think differentiation has to be played more into into the logistics of of every case and every school district. Yes. Um, my, like you said, I just I hate that we went from heroes to zeros in a matter of months. You know, celebrating teachers what they were willing to do in the beginning of this pandemic and going outside their doors and teaching and you know putting hotspots on buses and driving around so kids could have Wi-Fi's. And, you know, we were just, we were celebrated for doing things above and beyond. And then it was like, no, we expect you to put your life on the line now, you know, like you were in the military or something. And so, you know, for, and, and here's the deal, everybody is going to perceive this different. And the one thing I've learned about restorative is, is, and one thing that Denise has really helped me I come from, I was a football coach. I was a disciplinarian. You know, I'm a, an administrator. I, I come from this very black and white world. And Denise brought a lot of gray into my life. And we really are the yin and yang. That's why we're best friends. And we balance each other out. But I think what I've learned through this work is everybody's entitled to feel how they feel. And it, it's not right for us to invalidate somebody's feelings. Our job is to listen, to digest to try not to assume and to really start to see things different. So when you mentioned, you know, the things that came up during this time, I mean, the, the, with race and diversity and culture and, and politics, and there's just so many things that are impacting the world. And we're all just trying to teach kids, you know, in the middle of that. And that's why I have been an advocate to just say, you know, don't forget about building relationships with kids. And I'm not saying safety should not be our number one concern, 
But once you consider yourself safe, right, Joe? In other words, whatever that looks like for that little school or big school, Mm -hmm. whatever they deem safe, once you get past that, I feel, this is my personal feelings, like it's been crickets. Like nobody's talking relationships, connections. Nobody's talking about anything. And that's not a complaint. That is an observation that the way, it was already tough enough to get, teachers to understand the concept of building and sustaining relationships with kids as importance and value pre pandemic, mid pandemic. I think we have thrown, and this is my opinion. I'm entitled. Like you said, Joe, I don't work for a school anymore. I can say what I want. Right. And so what I'm saying is right now is some schools have said, forget about relationships. But what's interesting is they're saying, no, we need to build relationships, but we're not going to spend any money. We're not going to do anything. We're not going to enforce that. We're not going to put it, you know, we're not going to put anything, but then we're going to talk about like, well, don't forget social emotional learning or culture, diversity, trauma informed practices, all the big key hot words. Right. Yep. And then I'm like, but you realize all of the things that I just brought up, which are great. I'm not even putting them down, Joe. Those are necessities in in today's modern day school, right? But you realize all of those initiatives come in what I call lesson-based curriculums. Social, emotional learning, race, trauma, they're all going to come in a lesson-based. You were a teacher, Joe, you get this, right? And in my opinion, lesson-based curriculums blend relationships. They don't build relationships, which is why I've tried to get people to understand what if there were tools out there that don't require a lesson base, don't require a lesson plan, right? Don't require you to talk about race, culture, diversity, nothing, right? Don't even talk about trauma. How about if we just get to know each other? And it's so crazy, but if we build our rock of relationships, then the sands of initiatives are just crack falling through the cracks of schools right now. And I don't care how much money you're spending on it. Now you're asking teachers in the middle of a pandemic to also address social emotional needs of kids or trauma, or let's talk about race or let's whatever, but we don't even know each other, Joe. Oh right. I, I mean, does that make sense to you? What, uh, what it makes talking? so much sense to me because, you know, I don't, I, I don't, I'm not, a person who very publicly will talk about my political stance or beliefs is just like who I am. Right. But, but the one thing that I can say with confidence that I'm seeing in this country that I have never seen in my entire life is the, uh, uh, intense divide that is emotionally heated between two parties of people. And I grew up in a family where we talk, We talk to people and we like say, it's a, it is great that you think differently than me. I want to learn from you. I might never agree with you, but I hope you respect that too. And that is not what I'm seeing right now on the majority on both sides of a political agenda. And as I walk through the streets of Seattle and I see uh, what's happening, I'm over here like, have we just been so ingrained in technology that we lost the connection and relationship building that we have lost the ability to use our words to speak with people and, 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 uh, and still build a relationship. Now I'm not talking about the protests and things like that. I'm literally talking because I'm not talking about that by any means. I'm talking about the individual to individual who have two differences who are not able to speak. Yeah. And <laughs> what, is to when we talk about things like relationship centered learning, we're preventing this from ever happening again. We, yeah. I want to teach my kids and I want to teach the American children to respectfully disagree with each other's opinions and very tactfully your, use your words to convince, convey, and portray, but not attack, diminish, and, and, and cut down other people just because you know one, one fact about their beliefs. It's like, what is happening here? Yes, yes, that's it right there. Um, to be able to have um, those difficult, courageous conversations, um, you have to listen um, from a place of grace without judgment. Um, I want to hear, I want to know, but I can't come from a judgmental place. And the only way I can do that is if I'm really listening um, with grace. Oh, that was the perfect way to say it. That was the perfect, it says I'm listening with grace. Yeah. And so Joe, I think what you just summed up was the reason why we believe that 
trying to push relationship centered learning is to say, look, isn't relationships at the foundation of personal relationships, professional relationships, classrooms. And, and so it's the foundation of life, relationships and connections. And the fact that we've kind of pushed away from it is the reason why we're pushing to the center of it. We're leaning into it more than ever. And my message lately has just been like, well, look, okay, the school systems in general have been, you know, a variety of different pathways have created a lot of different things that have been dysfunctional in school, right? So here's the deal. What better reason than a pandemic to hit control, alt, delete and blow this crap up and start to say, we've, hey, look, we got it wrong. And we, and we knew we were going in the wrong direction. Listen to the people I've had on the show, right? You're going to be like, well, I quit and I started doing this, right? You know, Trevor, when I just talked to Trevor earlier, right? He's like, well, now I'm no longer doing it. I'm out here. I mean, we're, they're pushing the people out because we're realizing we've got to have another platform to do something in education, right? So why not take mid pandemic and go, okay, what if we could start from scratch and rebuild a school system? Because we started talking about the difference reopening a school system, Joe, versus reimagining. Mm -hmm. Reopen means like open like nothing happened, right? And there's very few schools that are reopening. Like it was just like we hit pause back in March and we opened up like it was nothing. I think you have to reimagine what the new school system is going to look like. So why not was your reimagining virtual, hybrid, online learning, you know, distance, social, di what all, was you reimagining all those other logistics? Why not reimagining putting relationships at the center of learning and doing what you just talked about, Joe, which is maybe we do, you know, maybe if it's not all Monday, but we're doing it for the first 10 minutes of every class or just something so that you say, one, we're going to build some accountability. We're not going to, it's not going to just be on a shirt. Don't forget to connect with kids. It's not going to be at the bottom of my email. It's not going to be just some slogan to get voted on the school board. It's, it's literally going to be put into play and we're going to have school leaders talk about it, put it into play. And then new teachers are going to hear about it in college preparation or alternative certification, and they're going to be prepared for it. And we got this new land where relationship centered learning is a foundation. And then when you can put the initiatives of some more social, emotional learning, race, culture, science, social studies, you know, all of those other things lay flat and perfectly. You don't have to jinga the pieces together when you push, put a flat platform of a rock of relationship down for every system. So that way, when they leave school, as you said, Joe, they go out into a world and they say, hey, others may not look like me or have the same um, sexual orientation as I do, right? So, but, the, but, the, but you're like, I learned that in my rock of relationships in schools because all kids are different and we all learn different and we all look different, right? And we all interact different and we listen to each other and we don't judge each other because I believe this, sorry, I'm on my quick soapbox and I'll end this, but I believe students always wanted a choice or a voice. We just never created a platform for that. And so the hard part is, is people say, how do you, I'm, you know where I live, Joe, very conservative state. I'm in Texas. I'm a football coach. I'm a disciplinarian. You know, I, I, I'm that typical white male that they judge, right? But you know, what's interesting, Joe, is I grew up very diverse, my brother was gay, drugs and alcohol of addiction. All my brothers are dead. I'm the last surviving member of my family other than my sister. I grew up drugs and alcohol. I, I started smoking at eight, cocaine at 12, right? I was partying as, a, as an adolescent. All I can tell you is, is I grew up and now I start to realize like, look, maybe it's time that we do listen to other people. That we do, that we listen with grace. We listen with understanding. And the reason I say that is, I'm going to ask a question. Denise, you and I haven't done our interview, but I'm going to ask you a question in front of Joe. I'm just saying, if you, Denise, have you seen a change in me when it oh. comes to listening with grace and, and being different over the last five years that we've been together? I haven't seen a change. I've seen a transformation. Um, and you, Kevin, totally transformation. Um, really understanding what it means, like to what is grace? Like understanding that and trying to understand more like the trauma that some people experience, especially between you and I, trying to understand more of what I've been through, my background, the conversations, the questions, the, the times that you really think about it and come back. 
Because like you said, sometimes we just have to have a time out. This is a heavy conversation and come back. So the transformation that I have seen in you, um, I'm really proud of you. Um, and the other thing is, I just need you to know, yes, he comes from a, a very um, a different kind of background than I do. But he also, my mom calls him, are you ready for this? White chocolate. <laughs> she calls him white chocolate because she met him and she was like, mm, child, mm -mm. he might be white on the outside, boo, but he, he got all that soul inside of him. And he is very soulful. And um, the transformation, yes, yes, the most giving person. Uh, when you talked about your foundation for teachers and Title I, my brain, my mind, and my heart immediately went to Kevin. Well, okay, listen, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to make this about me, I Joe. I That's not where I was at. What I, I, so I was like, why, why, how, my, my point, Joe, to this was this. If I can grow and I can transform, I promise you, others can. But you have to give them permission and you have to be intentional and you have to give them the space to understand What's needed now more than ever is the difference is we've got to be able to connect. We've got to be able to those communications. We've got to have those relationships. So sorry, Joe, we didn't mean to take over on that. That was just something. You that were just, more than fine. You were more than fine. So, this is great, man. so, so, so listen, Joe, um, I want people to get to know what you're mostly excited about now. So as we're wrapping up the show, what, what, what do you want people to know about Joe D what, what, what they can reach out to you. We're going to put everything in the show notes that you give us as far as links and things like that. Great. But I want people to know how can they follow you, get to know more about you, go to experience your comedy or get just to be connected with you. Because I would tell you as a social media follower, and you're definitely an influencer on social media. So the point is, is as a follower of you, I think if you're not following Joe D, you're missing out. Thank you. Thank you so much. You, uh, you, can follow, you can follow me on social media quite literally everywhere using the handle Mr. D times and then the number three, T-I-M-E-S and then the number three. You find me everywhere there. Um, I have a podcast as well. It's called the Social Studies Podcast, the podcast where I study being social by being social. And it's a little bit different. I have people from all walks of life. I have had very well-known fashion designers, chefs, doctors, other comedians, uh, actors and actresses, actresses, look, I can't even talk today. But one of the cool things that I do in the podcast is most of them were former teachers. And if they weren't former teachers, I get their hot takes on education. And it's a humor-based, it's a humor-based podcast. You know, come have a giggle, but it's the same thing that you're going to see in my show. We're going to think, we're going to learn, we're going we're gonna to do it, but all through the mask of humor. So check out the Social Studies podcast. And then also, um, I just did a virtual comedy show not too long ago. It was the Back to School comedy show where it was, uh, I did sketches with some of the characters that I do. I had some live guests. I had games and sponsors. The sponsor was wine because, you know, wine and teachers go along very well. Uh, but I actually am going to have another one. I'm going to be doing a winter, uh, mo it's not confirmed yet, but it's probably going to be a telethon, uh, live telethon online for the Mr. D the Mr. Dombrowski first year teacher scholarship, raising money for that. So you can find more information on that as it comes out by just following me on social media. If you follow me, you will hear about it. And I am excited for anyone who hasn't heard of me before to come join this insane world that I live in. Come take a look into my brain. I'm a little bit unfiltered, but I do not regret it, baby. So come on over to the land of D. <laughs> Yes, my brother. Oh, I love you. <laughs> well, Joe, we, 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 have, we, you know, we're just fans of you. We appreciate your time today. You, you know, we just appreciate your energy, your time, your ability to just keep things real. I think that's more important than anything else. I think that's what I've learned in this work is, is the more real and genuine and authentic you are, the more people can either accept it or not. Yeah. And, and I, and, and believe me and I've understood like, your circle gets smaller and that's okay. And I'm okay with that. 
uh, I am completely okay with the platform that we're in and what we're doing. And I'm just excited to share a space with you in education. We're, we're excited that we, we resonate a message that comes from, from Joe D and the fact that we, 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 we not only align with you, but we just, we celebrate what you do. And the fact that we can use you on our trainings and point people in your direction um, and just tell them, this is just another educator out there that has figured out how to be himself and yet still figured himself out to be like, how do you impact other people? Like you said, through the podcast, through, through your comedy, through everything that you're doing, we thank you for, for, for all of those platforms because without that, we wouldn't have Joe D th times three and we wouldn't be able to experience your stories, the darkness, but yet the realness of them. Because to me, don't, I don't want to ever make, I don't want to put mask that. I don't want to ever put makeup on that. I want to be able to be, bring that to the forefront. And I want people to know being an educator is tough and, and, and it's okay, but it is you, like you said, Joe, not everybody is, is cut out to do what we do and experience what we do, but please don't take it for granted. And we don't want to take your time for granted. We want to thank you for being on the show today. We will make sure everything gets in the show notes. Everybody gets to follow you and celebrate you. And we just thank you. Denise, you got any closing words for your, for, for your, for your buddy? No, just glad that you um, decided to come. And um, just for the future, you know, every Thursday I host a virtual circle for educators all over the country. Love I would love to have you on it. It's about an hour. Uh, fun. I'd love to have you. I'll send you that link. Um, we could co-facilitate together and it'd be a rocking party. But, but no, thank you so much. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that sounds fun. All right, Joe, any closing message for our listeners from you? I love you guys and I'll see you soon. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I want to thank you, the listener, the educator, the difference maker. Your time is valuable. I see time as an investment. And I thank you from the center of my heart for making it to the end of this episode. But please don't let this be the end of our relationship. If you have the same passion for putting relationships and connections at the center of all learning, then I need you to subscribe and share this podcast with other like-minded educators. It would be extremely helpful if you could leave a review or a comment on what you loved about this episode, or better yet, tell me what you want to hear more of in the future. This way, other educators that are searching for impactful podcasts can get a sense of what this show can offer them. My hopes and prayers or that you were able to find one strategy or one idea that you could take back to one classroom to make a difference for one kid. Thank you for keeping kids and relationships first. We'll connect with you next time. Try that again. Lastly, I wanna thank you, the listener, the educator, the difference maker. Your time is valuable. I see time as an investment. And I want to thank you from the center of my heart for making it to the end of this episode. But please don't let this be the end of our relationship. If you have the same passion for putting relationships and connections at the center of all learning, then I need you to subscribe and share this podcast with other like-minded educators. It would be extremely helpful if you would leave a review or a comment on what you loved about the episode, or better yet, tell me what you want to hear about more in the future. This way, other educators that are searching for impactful podcasts can get a sense of what this show can offer them. You see, my hopes and prayers are that you were able to find one strategy or one idea that you could take back to one classroom to make a difference for one kid. Thanks for keeping relationships first, and we'll connect with you next time.